But what do you think will be the impact if American Jews spent 25, sent $25 million a year for five years to help the emerging Jewish and dual communities in Israel? Mm -hmm. Thanks, it's a uh, really good question. Um, look, to be fair to the Israelis, I mean, in terms of um, the question of social justice, I mean, the Israeli protest movements of last summer dwarfed anything we've seen in the United States in terms of a protest movement about basic economic equality and economic dignity. Um, um, I, I think that there are a couple things. First of all, to, I've been you know, pretty critical of the American Jewish uh, organizational establishment, as you may have noticed. But um, there has been something that was started a few years ago, which I think is really good, which is that a, group, a lot of American Jewish organizations got together and said they were going to direct some funds to Israel's own Arab citizens. This is not the West Bank of Gaza. These are citizens of Israel inside the Green Line who have citizenship but also suffer discrimination inside Israel the borders. And I think for the American Jewish community to actually reach out to investing in those communities, which study after study, including by the Israeli government, shows tend to get less money for their schools, less money for their roads, less money for their housing, I think would be something we could do for Israel that would be really, really valuable. I think the other thing that we can do First of all, I think it gets to what the point you made at the very end, is we, it seems to me, can model uh, religious pluralism in a way that's very, very, very valuable for Israelis to see. The tragedy of Israel has been, I think, the creation of this chief rabbinate, which is, as usually happens when these kinds of institutions are created, becomes dictatorial and corrupt. And ultimately, what it does is it turns huge numbers of Israelis off of Judaism altogether. Because their only association with Judaism is this corrupt and unbelievably narrow-minded Israeli religious rabbin. Uh, and it seems to me that although reform Judaism and, and majority or conservative Judaism will have to be adapted for the Israeli ethos, being able to see forms of Jewish expression that are more in line with people's egalitarian values and that are more independent from the state is very, very valuable for Israelis. And so I think we should, as we do today, but continue to fight for those entities to be able to work in Israel because I think uh, potentially they offer a vision for Israel but besides this binary, I'm either going to be totally secular or I'm basically going to buy into this religious establishment which I think often gives Judaism a bad name. You might want to take the microphone out if you can't reach it. Yeah, that's good. My name is Judy Shapiro and I'd like to ask you what do you think that our American government Israel's military security advantage, and I particularly am happy that the U.S. government uh, in recent years has helped to build the anti-missile defense systems that Israel has, the arrow system, uh, for instance, this uh, um, uh, uh, Iron Dome, which gives Israel greater protection from rockets from uh, both uh, Gaza and from the north in Lebanon, because, you know, I mean, I'm a, I'm a dove, as you can tell, but there's no question that, that the arsenal, the military rocket arsenal that both has, that especially that Hezbollah has in the north, is very, very frightening for Israelis. Understandably, the rockets are getting, being able to go longer and longer. They can, they can probably reach Tel Aviv at this point, and that's terribly frightening for Israelis. And I think and anything America can do to mitigate that threat, um, uh, we should do. But when you're talking about America essentially helping Israel subsidize settlement growth, that really doesn't have anything to do with Israeli security. I think it's actually bad for Israeli security. So I think there are certain things we could do. For instance, we have a free trade zone, the United States, the United States does, with Israel. But I don't think we need to have a free trade zone with settler-made products in the West Bank. We, um, we don't need to make it very easy, as we do today, for Americans to give tax-deductible gifts to settler charities in the West Bank. Uh, there was a long New York Times piece about this, about this last year. Um, we actually, the official U.S. government policy is that we actually deduct from our aid package 
for the money which is spent in the West Bank. But, if, but in reality, we don't actually deduct that money. And I think we should. I think we should say, we want, we want to support Israel, we want to support, help Israel security, but we're not going to have U.S. money being spent to subsidize the settlement project, which is, which is contrary to American government policy, bad for American security, and bad for Israel. Well, how, Just how, how much of American money does go to Well, it's fungible, of course, and all the money is fungible, but basically, they're, 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 the U.S. government is supposed to basically make a calculation about how much of that money gets spent in the West Bank, and they deduct from that. But in reality, we don't actually deduct nearly the, the amount that we would if we were really doing the math correctly. Uh, and so I think we could actually, even just frankly threatening to do that. I mean, we would, Israel would still be our largest aid recipient. Uh, but even threatening to do that, I think, would actually give America more leverage to be able to deal with some of these issues like subsidies for settlement growth, to get the Israeli policy, to, to get the government to change its policy. Just because you, you raised some you know, government action, American action, and there has been a lot of controversy about yes, your boycott yes, yes. op-ed last March. Yes. Can you address, a number of people asked it, yes. um, first of all, do you regret that op-ed yes, yes. at all because yes. it sort of derailed attention, yes. I think, yes. from the book yes. as a whole? Yes. Um, and do you stand by it yes. today? Yeah, I do. I mean, you know, it was, it was certainly controversial and uh, produced uh, probably more angry reaction than anything else that I've written. Um, but um, I, I really believe that um, we have to confront, as American Jews, the degree to which we are complicit in Israel's kind of sleepwalking towards the death of Israel as a democratic Jewish state. And I think um, we don't have, we, it is absolutely morally acceptable for us to treat non-democratic Israel. Those part, those territories under Israel's control, in which, uh, in which, in which all people do not have citizenship and the right to vote, differently from the way we treat democratic Israel. Um, this proposal I made that we should invest our money inside the Green Line and buy products from within the Green Line, but not buy products and services from the West Bank, is a proposal that I made after after uh, being inspired by a group of Israeli artists and intellectuals, including the novelists David Grossman, Amos Oz, and Aleph Bet Yehushua, perhaps Israel's three most famous novels, all of whom said they would not perform in the cultural center in the settlement of Ariel. Actually, more recently, interestingly, the head of Israel's Weizmann Institute of Science has said that he is going to institute a boycott of the new university that Israel is creating in the settlement of Ariel. To give you a sense about how things are moving in the wrong direction, Israel is now creating its full first full-fledged university since 1972. It's in the settlement of Ariel, a settlement which, which would be very difficult for Israel to maintain in a peace agreement. Um, so, and in fact, there are other institutions like the Jewish Federation system, which essentially don't spend their money inside in the West Bank. So it's not actually as radical a proposal, I think, once you begin to think about it a little bit, as sometimes people might suspect. I do think we need to, we need to distinguish between the way we can treat that part of Israel that is trying to live up to Israel's democratic principles and that part of Israel that's not. I'm going to ask um, each of you to give your question and then let Peter answer them in the order he wants. So you can sit down and he can answer a few at a time in the interest of ending close to the time. And then we're going to have final words from a, a rabbi in our midst. Go ahead. My name is Benny Baba. Uh, I would like to make clear I am in total agreement with you in terms of your revulsion to the Netanyahu government and your sense of loss of democracy in Israel. However, I do not understand why you do not make clear that there was never a state of Palestine, it was the British mandate, and it was occupied by Jordan when the mandate ended in 1948-49 and was under occupation by Jordan. The West Bankers never had freedom, never had democracy. Israel is still the most democratic state in the Middle East. The other side of the story is, why don't you mention that there's a real difference between the different types of settlement? Ariel is idiotic, but the ring city around Jerusalem won't change. And, the, and the, uh, the computer settlements are not really settlements, so we must make a difference between them. And yes, we can be upset about some of those settlements, but there are others that are perfectly okay. I know, I got the sign to show. <laughs> but I think there needs to be a balance here. Israel is still democratic, yeah. and the Arabs are not. 
And it's not just the West Bank is, uh, is what we have to deal with. It would have to deal with Hezbollah and all the other Arab countries that still love to hate Israel and destroy it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, should, I, should I answer that? Should now let's, let's get the three. Uh, my name is Larry Weber. And my grandparents. Hi, Larry. Oh, yeah. oh my gosh. I grew up with him. <laughs> my grandparents emigrated from Vilna, Poland in the early 1900s. They became very successful. And they were Zionists. And they acquired thousands of acres of Palestinian farms in preparation for the State of Israel. And when the State of Israel was created, they gave all of this land by Herzliya to the government. Now, they're turning over in their graves because they wanted a democratic Jewish state. And what they're looking at is an expansionary group of religious writers combined with oligopolies of about 10 Israeli families that control a lot of the industry and the power in Israel. And they're the ones that are supporting the Netanyahu government, which is preventing us from having a peaceful settlement after 64 years. My name is Josh Shire. Uh, I want to know how you would account for the, I would say, near total collapse of the mainstream peace movement in Israel itself. And do you think, I mean, I would offer, apart from demographic changes and changes in the polity, uh, I mean, my feeling is that the left in Israel and the left in America has not accounted for really the violence in Gaza and to a lesser extent in the West Bank and the fact that the really animating central feature of Palestinian nationalism is not a two-state solution, but is the right of return of the refugees at the end of the state of Israel as we know it. And do you think, I mean, we can talk about settlements a lot, and I would oppose settlements, I would oppose Netanyahu, but really do you think that, how do you incorporate that into a, a plan of action to actually reclaim the center yeah, yeah. in Israel and here? Uh, yeah, I, I just want to thank this gentleman here for doing a thankless job very well. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, so those are really, really good questions. Let me, let me start with the first one. Um, the history, I don't know where that gentleman is, the history that you recounted is correct. There never was a Palestinian state. Uh, the Palestinians were under Jordanian control, and they hated being under Jordanian control. The Palestinians hated the, uh, the Hashemite monarchy in Jordan. They were treated terribly. Um, um, but today, it doesn't really matter. I mean, essentially what you just say is, these are human beings. They're individual people. They deserve the right to be citizens of a state with, the, with and, and what should come with that, which is the right to live under due process, the right to live equally to their neighbors who are of a different religion or ethnicity, the right to vote. If you don't want, uh, Jordan is not going to take them. And, they don't, uh, you, and uh, Jordan does not want to control the West Bank anymore, and the Palestinians don't want to be under their Jordanian control. Uh, they want a state of their own. Um, uh, the alternative is to say, there's, you know, I always find it puzzling when people say, there's no such thing as a Palestinian, they're an invented people. First of all, most peoples actually are invented, um, if you really think about it. It means that they didn't exist at some point in time. But let's say you're right. Let's say there's no such thing as a Palestinian. What, you want to call them an Israeli? and give them citizenship in the state of Israel, it really doesn't matter what you call them. Once you recognize that they are individual human beings who have certain basic rights, there has to be a state that they can be citizens of. If they're not going to be citizens of the state of Palestine, they're going to be citizens of the state of Israel. Uh, and then you're going to have a state that's no longer going to be a Jewish state. So it doesn't seem to me that that gets you out of the fundamental problem, um, uh, the, uh, which is the need of these people to be citizens in a state. Um, on the question of differences in settlements, I think it's important to rem I think it's important to remember that all settlements that are passed that are passed the green line um, uh, are settlements in, which live under the same legal regime. So whether they are some guy far on a hilltop somewhere or relatively close to the green line, they are all places where 
the, a Jewish person lives next to a non-Jew who does not have the same rights as them, where you live under a different law. So morally, I think that's very important to remember. Now, in terms of that you were right, that there are some settlements, clearly, that are easier for Israel to annex in a peace deal. The two largest settlements today, actually, are Beitar Elite and Modi'in Elite, which are ultra-Orthodox settlements that were built right on the Green Line. And there's really not any controversy about that. But it's very important to remember that Israel has to pay for those settlements, which is to say, the Palestinians are willing to accept the idea, of, have said they're willing to accept the idea of equal land swaps, which means however much territory you want to keep in the West Bank, Israel has to give equal amounts of equally valuable land, equally arable land inside the Green Line. So once you start getting beyond a two or three percent land swap, up to four or five or six or seven or eight percent, you not only create really significant contiguity problems, like I mentioned with Ariel, but you also create really significant problems about the land that Israel is going to swap. It was a fascinating piece by a demographer at Ben Gurion University who basically said, if we want to have a 6% land swap, we're going to have to move Israeli Jews off some of their kibbutzes inside the Green Line so we can trade that land to the Palestinians for the settlements we want to keep. So this is not cost free. And some of the settlements that people say are consensus settlements, I don't know if you, any of you have been to the settlement of Efrat, right? So especially, especially in the modern Orthodox community, Everybody knows Efrat. Everybody spent a Shabbat meal in Efrat. Efrat is lovely. Every, uh, everyone's had a great time. It's, very, it's a very, very nice place. Very lovely people there. Uh, everyone considers Efrat to be the prototypical consensus settlement. But the Palestinians have never been willing to accept Efrat. Why? Because it sits right on the major north-south artery that goes across the West Bank. So it's actually, there are settlements that we in the Jewish community always say, everybody knows that Israel will control this. The problem is that we're talking to ourselves. The people who don't know this are the people you have to negotiate with. And they often, often have actually fairly reasonable perspective on why some of these settlements are a problem. Um, on the question about the peace movement, which was a great, which was a great question. Um, why did the left in Israel collapse? Yes, as you suggested, it's partly demographic, especially the in, not only the rising Orthodox population, but the influx of a million Russians who lean very far to the right politically. Um, uh, for a variety of reasons that we could get to, but that I, that I, that I won't. Um, but it's also absolutely true that there is a strong feeling amongst many Israeli Jews that Israel essentially offered the Palestinians the moon um, in 2000, uh, and the Palestinians responded with the Second Intifada, which was incredibly harrowing in Israel. Um, uh, it was harrowing for the Palestinians, but it's really important to understand politics in Israel today to remember how harrowing the Second Intifada was. It wasn't just the number of people killed, it was the total randomness of the violence. It was the fact that you just simply did not know whether you were getting into a bus or going onto a, into a pizza parlor. You did not know when the next bomb would go off and you would be blown to smithereens. It was incredibly harrowing for, for Israelis that period. And the narrative that took hold in Israel amongst Israeli Jews was we gave them everything, they responded with the Second Intifada, we gave them Gaza, and they responded with rocket fire. As a subjective reality, that is true. That is become the dominant narrative. And one of the reasons it became the dominant narrative was that Ehud Barak, when he came back from the negotiations with Arafat, remember, he was running against Arab Sharon, and he was in a very difficult position, and he said, I gave Arafat everything, and he turned it down, I exposed him for the man that he is. Interestingly, there have been an increasing number of Barack's own advisors in recent years who have come forward and said, actually, that what Barack said is not true, and that the, there was much more ambiguity to the negotiations that took place in 2000 than Barack himself has said. But that subjective reality is deeply felt by Israelis. By the way, there is a Palestinian subjective reality which is completely different, which has much more to do with, which has to do with the idea that Oslo was a sham from the very beginning because it never dealt with settlement growth, and so you were negotiating over the size of a pie that Israel was simultaneously eating away. But I think the objective reality, as best as uh, the, we can determine it from the factual record, is not, does not correspond with that subjective reality that Israelis hold. It doesn't mean there's no truth to it. There is some truth to it. Hamas is an odious organization. They have the blood of a lot of innocent Israelis on their hands. Arafat was at the very, was a corrupt and weak and I think ultimately uh, 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 
criminal leader for not being willing to do to, to stand up to the forces that were leading the Second Intifada in 2000. But we have data on the re the causes of the Second Intifada that come from the Mitchell Commission, George Mitchell, who was sent there to do a study. And if you read the Mitchell Commission, you find that in fact the Mitchell Commission both blames Arafat for allowing the, second, the violence of the Second Intifada to spiral out of control, and also blames the Israeli government for its very excessive response to the stone throwing that broke out. Remember the stone? Into the second Intifada, I'm sorry for going into so much detail. The Second Intifada did not begin with suicide bombing. It began with stone throwing following Ariel Sharon's visit to the Temple Mount in September of 2000. And what the Mitchell Commission says is it was the Israeli government's very, very heavy-handed response to that stone throwing that helped to create the spiral that ultimately led to this terrible downward spiral that led to the suicide bombing that had started by 2001. So as a political, as a, as a subjective, you know, we all know in our own country, right, that sometimes the majority of people can have an idea about politics that you don't necessarily agree with, right? I mean, there was a certain narrative that took hold about why America about what happened, about how America betrayed the South Vietnamese in 1975 that had a lot of currency in the United States when Ronald Reagan was elected. Doesn't mean that it was true. Um, and so I think it's important for us to recognize the, the narrative that has taken hold in Israel about what happened, but that doesn't necessarily mean we have to endorse every element of it. Um. <laughs> I'm gonna end with one question of my own and then we're gonna hear um, from Rabbi Gendler. You said in an article, <clears throat> in an interview, I think it was in New York Magazine, there will be some point in the future when the two-state solution either will happen or it won't. I don't know at that point whether I'll have the heart or the stomach to be part of it. And I'm just wondering because it has certainly been where, whether people in this room or around the country agree with you or violently disagree with you. It has been a very personal road. People have, the attacks have been very, very cutting, and I think in, in some ways probably surprisingly, um, um, I would say personal and even disquieting in terms of just you as uh, someone who believes in this country and also is a very strongly identified Jew. So I guess if you could just talk for a second personally, since the book has come out and since these attacks continue, um, along with support as well kind of where you are um, with your stamina? Um, well, um, it's funny for me because um, the debate is so intimate and personal that it makes it very difficult in some ways. Um, and that people talk about this issue in a way that they don't think they talk about tax policy. Um, but for me, it's precisely that intimacy, that sense that People are so angry at me because I'm an apostate, because I come from within the tribe and have turned against the tribe. That, that, that creates, I think, the sense of anger and betrayal, which also creates, strangely, a bond that still exists even despite that enormous hostility. I mean, I still feel that bond. I mean, I, I, was, I, I was walking down the street a few months ago um, after, uh, before I gave a talk. And a woman said to me, are you Peter Beinart? And she said, I, I said, yes. And she said, I'm very, very angry at you. Um, and I thought, first of all, the way she phrased it was so interesting. I'm it was so personal. I'm very, very angry at you. And, and then she started to tell me why she was so angry. And then she said to me, it's so hot out here. You don't have anything to drink. My house is right next door. Come into my house, and I'll give you something to drink. So I said, all right, I'll go. So, so I went. And then her husband was sitting in the front room and she said, um, this is Peter Beinart. He has all these terrible things to say. Get him something to drink. He looks very hot. Um, um, and then for the next hour, she both plied me with food um, and, um, and, uh, uh, and told me about her kids and what their, some of their troubles and travails and why some of them were not as connected to Judaism as she might have liked and why that's so difficult and it's such a problem. But you know, with your kids, what are you going to do? They have to live their own lives all the time. <laughs> and told me that she feels that I'm a terrible threat to the state of Israel and, and, she, and, and, and how can I live with myself? And so I spent the hour with this woman both feeling that we're on different planets. She believed that Turner told me that Sharia, Islam was taking over America and, and all these things. And I also felt 
that she reminded me so much of so many of the people that I grew up with. She reminded me of people in my family. I grew up in a family where people uh, violently disagreed about politics, in which many of my closest relations with people who had politics that were to the right of Attila the Hun. And so I felt like I knew this woman, and I was connected to this woman, and ultimately, in a strange way, I, 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 uh, the, I believed, I trusted her at some level that we were bonded by something that was deeper than our political disagreements. And I, I was walking to the gym when I had this strange diversion of going into her house for an hour. Um, and I went to the gym, and then when I was coming back, I passed by her house and I kept looking to see if she was still there. And when she wasn't there, I felt this sense of disappointment, you know? Um, and so I guess for me, you know, that's part of this struggle for me is that is to um, is uh, to make the case because I believe in it very strongly um, and because I think it's morally urgent, and also find a way of maintaining that sense of connection and bond because I do believe that there is something called the Jewish people. That's what I teach my children. That's what I was taught, and I believe it has to be deeper than our political disagreements, even when our political disagreements are as urgent as this one. Thank you. So, so the first question is, shall we do this again next year? Uh, we are honored today, truly honored, to have with us uh, Rabbi Everett Gendler, who is Rabbi Emeritus of the Temple Israel in Lowell, Massachusetts, and was the Jewish chaplain at Phillips Academy for over 20 years. He wants to speak to us for a very few minutes. Rabbi Gendler. Uh, we shouldn't pass unnoticed the fact that the proudly secular Schaefer family invites a rabbinic presence for three minutes. <laughs> if, 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 you, if you want uh, affirmation of expanding spirit, here you have the evidence. In this spirit, uh, I'd like to share with you a very personal reaction to uh, Peter Beinert's extraordinary book and presentation this afternoon. You know, through the centuries, through the millennia, Jews have puzzled. How are we still here? What accounts for our survival? Eh, you know, anti-Semitism, this, that, the other. Often, the rabbinic response was zuchut avot v'imachot, the merits of the matriarchs and patriarchs. And uh, there's profound truth to that. All of us live and have our moral passion by virtue of the ancestors. Um, I had occasion recently to confess that my two primary extraterrestrial companions during adolescence.